Good morning, this is Dr. John Bennett broadcasting from Miami Beach in the morning, 6.30 in the morning. We have the honor of having uh, a very well-known educator in India, a great guy too also. Uh, <clears throat> he's gonna be lecturing to a group of neurosurgical residents and I'm gonna let Rush Roshab take over. Welcome Roshab. Yes, thanks a lot. Thank you very much uh, for being a very part and parcel of this journey. Uh, I'll give a very short introduction to Professor Devpujari today. Uh, yes. So, can is my screen uh, visible to everyone? Yeah, uh, to me. Well, not yet. Not yet. Mm. You may have to reload that. Okay. Just, just reload it. <clears throat> Sometimes it doesn't show up. Mm. The, the, the LAN and everything is a bit of issue in my area. Okay, well, can we just skip this or, or, or just say it orally? Yeah, I'll just uh, go about it orally. Yeah. Uh, so today we have uh, Professor Dev Pujari with us. Professor Dev Pujari is uh, head of the department at uh, Bombay Hospital. His major neurosurgical training was at the JJ Hospital. And later on, he has gone on to done fel do fellowships at uh, Newcastle, England, Henry Ford Hospital at Detroit. He's a visiting professor, uh, professor at Shinshu University, Japan, Kuwait National University at Kuwait, and Emory University, Atlanta, USA, along with uh, the Indian Institutes of SGPGI Lucknow and Ames, New Delhi. He's published various amounts of book on endoscopic transphenoidal surgery, clinical neuroendoscopy, Practical Neurosurgery. He's been a guest editor to Neurology India, one of the one most reputed journals for neurosurgical uh, residents in India. Uh, he has written chapters in the textbook of neurosurgery in India, WFNS textbook of neurosurgery, textbook of hydrocephalus, handbook of pediatric neurosurgery, textbook of pediatric neurosurgery, skull-based meningioma, craniosynostosis, and so on. He has about 70 papers in reviewed, peer-reviewed journals, currently the chairman of WFNS Neuroendocrine and Neuroendoscopy Committee and one of the past presidents of NSI, International Society of Pediatric Neurosurgery and AS, AASPN. So we'd like to welcome Professor Dev Pujari and thank you for uh, taking out time on a Sunday <laughs> to impart your knowledge regarding the topic which we are about to discuss today. Thanks a lot, sir. Thanks, Rishabh, uh, for a kind introduction. Uh, I must understand your format correctly. I think you have a case presentation, right? Yes. So uh, the format of the Rishabh, today. Are you uh, there still? Uh, today... Yes, sir. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. So the format no. of today's presentation would be going about John, as. That's okay. There's some background interference. That's okay. Go ahead. Continue. Yeah, so the format of the today's uh, broadcast would be, uh, I'll be presenting a short case of a cranial SOL. We'd like to reach, to, we'd like to know how to approach towards the, uh, towards reaching the diagnosis. Since we are specifically targeting an intraventricular SOL. So we'll try to see how to reach an intraventricular SOL on basis of history and examination as a neurosurgical resident perspective. And later on, uh, Professor Dev Bujari can elaborate how he approaches uh, towards diagnosis of an intraventricular SOL. What are the anatomical structures he needs? Uh, we need to uh, look into while we are operating the uh, intraventricular SOLs, and what are the different intraventricular SOLs which we need to take care of. So, uh, is is that uh, about it? Should we start? Yes, we're ready to start. Uh, Professor John, I'm still not able to share my screen somehow. Okay, well, keep trying. You'll get it. We've done it before. <laughs> I know. I've done it before. That's okay. Somehow That's okay. I... You, you can do it. You can do it. Somehow, I always keep on facing that problem. No, that's all right. Sometimes we have a little, little problem. That's okay. 
I can always edit this out. <clears throat> so I'm just connecting through one of my iPads too, so that uh, we do not have, we do not face any problems while. Uh, Okay, we can methodically approach this by being calm, just like have an open brain. <laughs> brain. Uh, you know, um, can you <clears throat> uh, email me my power, your PowerPoint? I can share it. So, oh, there you go, uh, there you go, you got it. So I'll just be sharing. I know it's not easy on a smartphone, that's good, man. <laughs> yeah. Okay, looks good. So I'll just start, start with my presentation now. So I'm presenting a case today on uh, the SRI. Are you uh, okay there, Rosh? Is it better right now? Do we have any interference? Hello, Rush, are you there? Yeah, I'm still there. Do we face Okay. Sorry about this, Dr. Theo Fajari. We'll, we'll have it together. Hello? Yes, it's going. Yeah. yeah. Are we facing any interference issues right now? Okay, we can see it. It's fine. Yeah. So uh, today I'm presenting a case of a cranial SOL. My patient uh, is a 22-year-old female, Ashwini Pandit. Resident of Nasik, Hindu by religion, Marathi speaking person, educated to 12th standard, right handed person, was a housewife by occupation. The informant was patient herself along with her, uh, her parents, which were reliable. Uh, my patient came with chief complaints of headache for two months, vomiting two months since two months, with blurring of vision since one month. Uh, Rush, rush, we can't really distinguish what you're saying. It's kind of garbled. Um, can you address that? Can you fix it at all? Is it better now? That's more, a little bit clearer, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry for the uh, glitch. I'll uh, just restart it again. So my patient, Ashwini Patin, a 22-year-old female, resident of Nasik, Hindu by religion, a Marathi-speaking person, educated till 12th standard, a right-handed person, and was housewife by occupation. The informant was the patient herself, along with her parents, and were reliable. The patient came with chief complaints of headache since two months, vomiting since two months, and blurring of vision since one month. Uh, the patient complains of an insidious onset, gradually progressive frontooccipital headache, non-radiating, mild to moderate in intensity to start with, complaints of an early morning headache, which is relieved by vomiting, occasionally disturbs her sleep at night, aggravated by stress and relieved by rest, and medication, uh, analgesic medication initially, now it is not relieved by medication also. Uh, there is no history of photophobia, visual, sensory aura, redness or tearing of eyes. The patient complains of vomiting at early morning, three to four episodes in last one month, which is projectile in nature, non-bilious, and is associated with headache and complains of relieving of headache on vomiting. Uh, the patient also complains of blurring of vision since last one month, which has made her to visit a local ophthalmic store to check eyes uh, to check her eyes. There is no diurnal variation in blurring of vision. Uh, patient also complains of generalized weakness with malaise since two months, which has led to her avoiding work or being easily fatigued while doing daily course. Patient does not have any significant medical or dietary, uh, family or dietary history. Uh, patient has undergone medical termination of pregnancy three months back. She does not have any associated significant past or other medical history, and she does not have any double vision 
abnormal eye movement deviation of eyeballs there is no impaired memory speech loss of consciousness seizures there is no history of fever neck stiffness or night sweats there is no history of weakness in any of the limbs on examination of the patient the patient was an averagely built averagely nourished female with a weight of 45 kg patient was well oriented to time place and person with a norm uh, normal vital uh, structure that is 70 pulse which was regular in rhythm and volume 110 by 86 of bp and 16 in respiratory rate she does not have any pallor icterus clubbing cyanosis edema or lymphadenopathy on neurological <coughs> examination of the patient the patient was conscious well oriented to time place and person with a normal recall for recent and remote memory patient has a minimental score of 20 7 by 30 she has a normal speech though there is no evidence and there is no evidence of any lobar signs on cranial nerve examination the only cranial nerve uh, we found uh, abnormality is was in optic nerve she had a vision of 6 by 12 in both the eyes on snellen chart examination there was normal color as uh, color vision on ishara chart the bilateral pupil were 3 mm reacting to light circular and brisk reaction normal direct as well as consensual right reflex bilaterally bilateral field of vision was normal when compared to examiner on the confrontation test and there was grade to frisson grade to pallidema on ophthalmoscopic examination the rest of the neuro neurological examination was essentially normal for the patient so, so i think uh, should, ah please summarize yeah yes sir uh, to summarize uh she is a 22 year 22 year old female with gradually progressive frontal occipital headache which is not relieved on medication currently and is associated with projectile non bilious vomiting at early morning along with blurring of vision with a frisson grade to pallidema my most likely diagnosis points towards hydrocephalus and my differentials would include an intracerebral sol or migraine so uh, essentially abida is also around right yes sir yes sir uh, i am here so please you also join me in asking questions abida yes sir i think one of the most important things what you have just described is a little bit concerned to me i do, i have not heard anybody uh, you know describing as fronto occipital headache so can you i mean we usually talk about fronto temporal occasionally you may call fronto parietal if it is unilateral on one side but fronto occipital becomes a little vague term for me so can you describe the headaches a little better okay uh, sir her complaints were mainly she started having a headache which was initially localized to the frontal region which later now she is complaining that she is having pain in the frontal region as well as the occipital region as in it is an holocranial headache i mean it so basically you are trying to say it is a holocranial headache started in the front but later on it has also become uh, it is affecting uh, uh, is the, does it get worse on any straining kind of a situation no sir she does not uh, complain of uh, not only on straining or it is front occipital all the time uh, no she did not complain of any aggravation of pain in any particular region while straining or cupping or sneezing so basically you have a person who has a typical signs of raised intracranial pressure with early morning headaches and vomiting and which is progressively increasing and yes. has pallidema so yes, you sir. have put your first diagnosis as hydrocephalus now uh, again i find that a little bit odd you can say that uh, uh, a progressively increasing lesion without any localizing signs i think that is what you are trying to say because uh, uh, communicating hydrocephalus as such would not uh, oh. progress like this not so okay. acutely and uh, uh, not with an, in a such a distinct manner you would probably okay. have other uh, association with it So okay, what sir. you are trying to say is uh, that you have a progressively increasing uh, intracranial uh, uh, 
hypertension without any localizing signs is that what i yes, do i understand correctly uh, yes sir yes sir do you have any more questions to ask and do you have any thing to offer the thing is that because he is basically presented as something as raised intracranial pressure that's it his presentation comes with just that conclusion that he has the person has raised intracranial pressure could be due to any cause there is nothing else that is clarif clarified from the history my one question is why have you put migraine as a differential diagnosis absolutely uh we have dr roman bunak uh, from slovenia who has also joined us and i'll be very happy john if you can uh, allow him to uh, yeah of course of course he can he's like everyone else they can join roman are you there yes i'm i'm here Okay, good. Uh, welcome, so I, welcome. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I understood this case similarly as uh, non-localizing uh, progressive intracranial pressure uh, development. So I, in fact, uh, what what bothers me is uh, in fact that it was duration of two months. This yes. is quite long time for. Unfortunately, so Roman, that is that is uh, unfortunate truth in India. We we get patients very very late, and uh, the other question I had uh, to ask was that was it associated with the termination of pregnancy or the pregnancy itself? Did it start before she terminated pregnancy, or because there are we are aware that there are many lesions which we can manifest during pregnancy. Okay. I've, uh, she did not complain of any particular pain uh, during pregnancy. We tried uh, asking her whether her uh, medical termination of pregnancy was related to headaches. She did not give any history relating to it. But uh, conspicuously, the headache has been uh, progressive since her medical termination of pregnancy. So that is one thing which I could not relate it and. In, did the headaches get uh, aggravated with any change of position or anything like that? Did you ask? Uh, sorry, ma'am, I did not get your question. Did the headache change aggravate with any change of position, or were they more by change of position? Was there any change in the headache pattern? No. Okay. Uh, the pattern of headache, or uh, on position, or lying down, or stooping, per se. And uh, you have not answered Abida's earlier question. Uh, was Migraine. it related to yes? How do you differentiate on the basis of history, uh, sir? My pain I have uh, put because she is a young female who complained of a, a dull aching headache, which uh, progressed to a throbbing headache, which is disturbing her sleep, and uh, uh, she is giving a history uh, of. Uh, headache getting aggravated post pregnancy so that was one of the reasons for which i put in uh, migraine as one of the differentials however the, the grade of papillary edema does not coincide with the uh, presentation or my differential of migraine but because of the timing i have put in migraine as one of my differentials sir <laughs> the headache of the migraine is more episodic it's not as long lasting uh, etc uh, more acute and then it uh, reduces in intensity uh, so roman apart from the uh, long standing duration is there anything else which you would like to ask well um, i have a question about the mental status when she was she was a housewife but was she able to do all work all things uh, for two months yes uh, so she has been able to do uh, the work she is not finding any difficulty in doing the work however she is getting tired uh, she is having generalized weakness and she is feeling weak throughout the day which because of which she has been avoiding uh, long standing work able to do all work all things so we have a patient uh, after uh, history and uh, examination we have still a patient 
who has raised intracranial pressure and absolutely no localization yes sir how do we proceed further what would you like to uh so for this patient particularly uh so he is asking like to... a question just so we have a patient uh, after uh, history and uh, examination we have still a patient who has raised intracranial pressure absolutely no localizing yes so it is the echo from my voice okay uh so for this patient particularly uh so he is asking a question um professor john there is some uh, video or audio lag i guess okay it could be uh, okay i'll check it okay okay it's okay yeah yes uh, there is some uh, So you see the question in the chat why can't she have chronic sdh do you see that question in the chat um, okay she is not having any localizing signs per se You see the question in the chat why can't she have chronic sdh Do you see that question in the chat? I think. Uh, okay. So he is not having any localizing signs per se. I would have um, probably agreed if you had put in a diagnosis of something like benign intracranial hypertension. Do you see the question in the chat? Why can't she have chronic? But sir, uh, she is too young or uh, she is too young and is not well built to. be diagnosed with benign intracranial hypertension get it in you in fact uh, more likely you get agreed if you are putting a diagnosis of something like benign okay. intracranial hypertension um professor john i think the youtube link is echoing into the zoom link mm. what's that uh the youtube link or the one which you are broadcasting on youtube or facebook the audio is bouncing on the zoom link okay is that better yeah better okay okay yeah so what do we do now uh so for this patient she is uh, since she is already postpartum uh, we would like to get a ct scan done and initially I, I to why why not go for an mri directly we can sir there's no i mean uh, that is the best investigation available today best investigation available to you and certainly going to throw more light on the situation uh, i think ct scan would be just because if your hospital does not have an mri scan mri or uh, uh, if there is any contraindication to mri scan okay okay so so we so like I to proceed yeah so MRI. i can show us whatever ct mr whatever you got it done first i i have the mr sir i'll show you the mr of the patient i mean i am happy you didn't start with x ray it is not necessary to uh, say Mm. Uh, what has been done somebody might have asked for an x ray and somebody might have asked for a ct scan but when it comes to a, a question as to what you investigation you want i think your answer has to be an mr mr so uh, this is the mr of the patient sir uh, she underwent an t2 flare uh, uh, on the mr the patient is uh, showing to have an uh, t2 and flare hyper intense lesion uh occupying the la lateral ventricles from the frontal horn body and the atrium of the ventricle in also involving the posterior occipital horns and uh, on general protocol if you are trying to show it for a space of pain lesion is to show the t1 images first uh, uh so actually the uh, the t1 images of the patient were not provided to us since uh, she is already Done it from an uh, private hospital, 
so that was one of the issues with this okay we had we have a, a t1 contrast but we don't have a t1 plain uh, image of the patient uh i think you can probably uh blow up the image of the player image as much as you can on your screen can you enlarge it further yeah uh, is it now, yeah it is okay now you talk about it explain what you are seeing so so on flare image uh, i can see an uh, space of uh, an hyper intense space occupying lesion uh, which is uh, uh, present in the right sided frontal horn body atrium of the lateral ventricle as well as occupying the occipital horns and it is displacing the septum pellucidum and uh, displacing the septum pellucidum towards the opposite ventricle which is make obstructing the left sided lateral ventricle what is the evidence of obstruction of the left lateral ventricle so the size of the uh, uh, left sided lateral ventricle as compared to the right is uh, comparatively smaller if so it is compressed to... sorry sir so it is compressed yes sir compressed hmm. what else is noticeable uh, so we can uh, see dilatation of the uh, uh, temporal horns of the lateral ventricle whereas the third ventricle and the fourth ventricle uh, seem to be of normal uh, size so the third ventricle on the right side is dilated uh, sorry the uh, lateral temporal horn on the right side is dilated yes sir. what's happening to the occipital horn so even the occipital horn is dilated on the also right dilated. side right so the right ventricle is dilated dilated yes sir is there any other comment on the uh, right side to be made so we so we we can see an uh, uh, the differential uh, csf intensity in the frontal horn compared to the occipital horn in addition to that what else do you see can you see a demarcation of the right lateral ventricle as good as the left lateral ventricle frontal horn no sir so you have And an altered, you have an altered density with a hyper dense margin yes sir yes sir so what does that indicate so therefore when you describe a lesion you have described that the lesion is occupying the frontal horn the body and the occipital horn is fine but in addition mm. to that you have to say homogeneous or heterogeneous okay does okay. it have does it have a cystic component or not mm. yes sir it has a cystic component so that cystic component is on the right side if i if i don't agree with you what is the alternate explanation mm, so it um, could be uh, the csf which is getting collected and uh, op uh, is obstructed by the mass from the flow trap trap csf trap frontal trap mass. csf yes sir it is not in tune with rest of the circulation what else yes, will sir. you describe what else will you describe on this image so there is a periventricular ooze which we can see on the uh, left side in the occipital horn and uh, the frontal horn whereas comparatively on the and right it side it is predominantly not... it is predominantly seen on the left side yes sir so if you have to tell me that this is a intraventricular lesion and not a extraventricular lesion exophytic into the ventricle how will you tell me one more sentence you have to use um uh, sorry sir i not able to comment abhi the anatomy to bahut achhi dikhati i am sure she will tell you radiological anatomy also well abhi the please tell him the essential factor which would differentiate this being intraventricular versus exophytic uh, lesion 
first thing is there is asymmetric dilatation of both the ventricles okay so your right one is more dilated than the left you can see that the septum region of the septum pellucidum foramen and monro and going it's the tumor can be seen in the midline going both into the frontal and the occipital horns occipital. you yes, will not have such a kind of tumor that is ex extra ventricular which will come into the ventricle like this and basically okay. you can see that the ventricle is dilated around the tumor so you can see the okay. different one is here you cannot see the frontal horn on this side the occipital horn is dilated behind the tumor and there is asymmetric dilatation of the ventricle and if it was okay. a extra ventricular uh, pathology uh, on the right side you would have seen some perifocal edema isn't it yes sir perifocal edema yes, sir. around the tumor is particularly absent on the right side completely absent yes uh, roman you have anything to add we we have to study radiological anatomy very well in our country yeah. uh, a lot of examination happens on the radiological images yes i i had impression that this is something from the from the fornix corpus callosum right uh, protruding down to the um, fourth ventricle occupying uh, most of the right one do trapping mm. really <laughs> only this <laughs> yeah i think we might get a better anatomical delineation and more uh, characteristic of the tumor can be found on enhanced images please go ahead with show us uh, contrast enhanced images uh, is it visible sir yeah. yes yes uh, so we are seeing an uh, heterogeneously contrast uh, heterogeneously enhancing image uh, on t1 contrast uh, uh, t1 contrast uh, yeah, image so the image shows uh, an mass arising from the midline of the ventricle which is compressing the left lateral ventricle and occupying the majority of the right sided ventricle including the frontal horn body and the atrium and the uh, occipital horn it shows uh, uh, areas of cystic uh, uh, areas of cystic nature and uh, uh, it is it is present up till the roof of the third ventricle but not invading the third ventricle i think you are reading a bit too much i <laughs> don't know if it uh, can be so it, i mean if you really want to talk about that you should show us a coronal image okay Uh, so i don't have a contrast coronal but i have a contra so no i don't have a coronal image sir for now okay so i think i agree with most of your description uh, and uh, i think uh, i'm i'm not too sure about the third ventricular involvement or not involved but the lesion is predominantly coming from probably either the septum or uh, corpus callosum or fornix i think that yes sir seems to be a fair assumption based on your history i think uh, fornix is unlikely because patient would have had uh, a lot of other issues uh, by this time if it was primarily arising from fornix so when we talk about a intraventricular tumor where else can it arise from Uh, so it can arise from the choroid plexus uh, like a choroid plexus papilloma or a choroid plexus carcinoma it can uh, a, a thalamic uh, a thalamic gbm can uh, invade into the ventricles uh, having a picture like an intraventricular sol we just talked about the fact that it is not extraventricular pathology intraventricular yes sir we have agreed that it is intraventricular pathology now you talked yes, about choroid plexus carcinoma at what age does the choroid plexus carcinoma occur have you ever seen it in an adult no sir about it is an adult it is a typical disease of children less than 3 years children. old not yes, even sir. children less than 3 years of age most of okay. the choroid plexus tumors above the age of 3 years are benign they okay. it is a metastatizing lesion which is very rare okay. but can happen okay uh 
so when you have a midline lesion which is not producing any signs and symptoms localizing most likely it is either coming from septum or from the ependyma so yes, what is possible pathology so this could be a central neurocytoma uh, since on the picture it seems to be arising from the midline and near the septum so, so uh, most probable diagnosis for this patient should be central neurocytoma and secondly an ependymoma intraventricular right. ependymoma fine uh any anything to add roman abida difficult to say something more <laughs> any questions to be asked further before we let him talk about the treatment go ahead i think abida yeah he can go ahead i think just show the sagittal image also once uh, whatever image is uh, projectable please show us all the images before we go for uh, the surgical option Ah, oh, sorry. We had a T one, sir, uh, which was a sagittal image. So this is a T one image, a sagittal section, uh, showing a ventricular. It is iso intense. It is okay. Iso, yes, sir. And uh, uh, it does not show any diffusion restriction per se. No, but there is one important thing which you are showing me that on T two aided diffusion. Becoming significantly hyperindicated. These are tituated images, or so this is uh, the upper ones are the diffusion images, the lower okay. one are the ADC images. Okay. So it shows a bit of diffusion restriction also. There is some diffusion restriction. Yes, sir. Okay. Fair enough. No coronal image you could find. and uh, no sir it wasn't provided okay. per se this is the coronal image which we got of t2 that is all about it right let's have a look can you blow up a little bit more okay so what will you do rishab for this patient uh so for this patient per se uh so for this patient per se uh, uh considering uh, the image characteristics and the age of the patient uh, i would preferentially diagnose the patient to be having a central neurocytoma uh, which being a grade 2 a who grade 2 tumor uh, would like to go for a, a gross total excision of the tumor through an uh, interhemispheric transcalosal approach and uh, uh, excise the tumor well the, we should we'll be doing a gross total excision of the tumor initially right so dr deepak jha is asking us that why are we asking to be to see the coronal and sagittal images and why don't we ask for more images uh can you give an answer or should we give that answer to him so for the coronal uh, we are asking for a coronal image to look for the infiltration of the uh, infiltration of the tumor into the third ventricle extension or infiltration whatever way you want to call it and yes sir and uh, mainly to look whether the tumor uh, is arising from corpus callosum and projecting into the ventricle or uh, is it arising from the septum pellucidum per se and to uh, look for the characteristics yeah you get a much better idea in coronal plane what is its relation to the roof of the ventricle what is its relation to the floor of the ventricle and how how is the involvement of the third ventricle yes sir and especially you want to know if the floor of the third ventricle is involved or not before deciding on your approach yes sir and also to look for infiltration of the tumor on the opposite ventricle because uh, since we are finding uh opposite ventricle being displaced rather than being uh, uh invaded by the tumor so say this three things 
Right. So Abhida, Dr. Rishabh wants to do a transcalosal surgery for this tumor's radical resection. Do you agree with the plan? Yes, sir. I agree with the plan. Roman, you have any different approach? <clears throat> maybe, maybe I would check uh, CSF then uh, tumor markers. Maybe mm -hmm. it could be also a needle check with a needle a needle biopsy. So you mm -hmm. feel that we should probably do a burr hole and either endoscopic or a needle biopsy because uh, you suspect a more malignant pathology. Or a, even a germinoma. Is that what you're saying? A germinoma, yes, yes, yes. I mean, uh, lesion is not reaching floor of the third ventricle, and uh, it's more in the anterior aspect of the lateral ventricle. So, uh, which is not a common location, but I think it can happen. Intraventricular, uh, germin purely intraventricular germinomas are well known. Though most of them are in the third ventricle. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the second point is about biopsy. I think if you are considering radical resection and in your differential diagnosis, if you have a malignant, highly malignant pathology, then maybe it is a good idea to do a biopsy. And uh, it can be an initial procedure to do maybe uh, an endoscopic biopsy and get some CSF sample. But as the patient is symptomatic, lesion looks relatively localized. I think planning direct uh, excision may not be uh, wrong. May, mm. may be, may, I mean, certainly has its own merit. Uh, there is another is question in the chat box from somewhere. Uh, would you consider doing a VP shunt first? I expected this. So please give answer to this question. <laughs> A very important question because a lot of people, you know, will rush that patient is symptomatic and uh, why why not put a shunt first? Uh, sir, uh, particularly for this patient because uh, we can see a uh, localized dilatation of the right ventricle which is having the tumor. So, uh, approaching from the right side to put an uh, VP shunt goods is already all out of question. To approach from the left side, it is going to be difficult to have a ventricular catheter within the uh, chin ventricles. So, rather than so going for... The answer, answer would be that uh, the ventricular system is not communication with each other. So, a single shunt will not suffice. Not and The yes, pathology sir. looks amenable to radical excision. That would be yes, your sir. first choice. Yes, sir. Uh, so, I... I uh, myself agree about the idea that uh, uh, we will uh, do go by transcalosal approach uh, and uh, how will you do the surgery? Will you like to talk about it or uh, should we talk about it later? Um, so, anyway. so, so for uh, this particular patient, we will like to do a, a frontoparietal craniotomy um, which, uh, since the tumor is, uh, Rishabh, extending... you have to be, Rishabh, you have to be very particular about using words. In, uh, uh, transcalosal approach, you either do a anterior transcalosal approach or very rarely you do posterior transcalosal approach. You okay. do not do parietal craniotomy. Okay. Whenever you are doing a transcalosal approach, you are doing a frontal craniotomy. You, you do not want to get into the parietal. Into the parietal. Okay. Why you don't want to do that? So because of the harm of affecting the motor area. Not only that, there are bridging veins and you do not want to sacrifice veins between the uh, coronal suture and uh, sure. at least for, uh, last two, three centimeters of the uh, lambdoid suture. Okay. So we, we don't do that. Uh, and the disconnection syndrome is also very high over there. So if you have to do it, you have to do it only in front of the right. coronal suture or right at the back near the... Is that correct, madam? Yes, sir. <laughs> okay. Yes, sir. We cannot go beyond behind about one centimeter behind the coronal suture is a no-no. And just basically anterior to that, you're safe. And splenium you have to avoid. 
you can make Absolutely. an interest anterior to the splenium you may just get away with it but not in the splenium you really have a very narrow corridor if you are doing a posterior transcalosal approach and okay. very rarely required uh so i think uh, uh, i agree that uh, my first priority is probably ependymoma rather than neurocytoma but uh, both are probably equal and uh, you have you already operated on the patient or not yet uh, yes sir we have operated on the patient so what is the pathology tell us <laughs> sir it came it turned out the frozen has turned out to be central neurocytoma we are awaiting uh, the hpr of the patient fair enough what uh, there is another question from dr jha that would you do venogram whenever you are doing a intraventricular surgery for protection of deep venous system uh, yes sir we like to uh, know the venous anatomy because of the uh, deeper veins especially the septal and the uh, thalamostriate veins which are at, at the floor of the uh, lateral ventricles so injuring a thalamostriate vein would uh, lead to weakness of, to the patient not only weakness i mean if it uh, thrombosis progresses into the internal cerebral vein you can actually have patient uh, going into a very bad situation uh, yes sir. roman do you get uh, mr venogram done in every patient of intraventricular tumor no of course not but um, here here it would be really valuable i think i think one of the main reasons i am not too much worried about this uh, uh in this particular patient is because it is almost strictly on one side Indeed. and uh, yes and i think uh, uh you can probably uh, take care of uh, uh, your venous system unless uh, you are too adventurous and unfortunately damage uh, something on both the sides uh but yes it is an important investigation and can help you to uh, be careful about uh, uh, saving these structures during surgery okay sir uh so i think that's that's a good uh, case and uh, very very typical case most patients present uh, i think i'll cover that in my talk so if yes, you sir. you have any other any i think uh, let us finish off with the questions related to the case before we go for that uh Thing. There are not problems, many questions. Rusha, what problems will you expect when you are going for a transcalosal approach, interhemispheric transcalosal approach? Uh, so, the, sir, uh, so, ma'am, to uh, initially we need uh, since the cranot uh, right from the cranot me we need to be careful that we don't injure the sagittal sinus initially while doing a cranot me because uh, uh, while going interhemispheric we will have. the midline uh, the crano uh, the craniotomy will be 1 uh, cm to the lateral of the midline so injuring of the sagittal sinus initially secondly uh, while approaching through the interhemispheric approach uh, we need to take care of the pericalosal and the uh, calosal marginal arteries uh, do not end up injuring or coagulating those arteries and uh, uh, injuring the uh, uh, coagulating the thalamostriate vein as uh, i said before what well, if the brain is tight in such a large tumor the brain is not going to be lax brain is going to yes. be tight yes ma'am so what are you going to do just unable to get into the intramuscular fissure so we like to tap from the left sided frontal horn through the cockers point you know left frontal horn it chinked ching even with navigation it may be difficult to tap that horn but uh, you can tap the ipsilateral frontal horn isn't it yes sir but uh, yes sir It's already open there, right? Yes, yes, yes. Any other yes. option? Mm. 
so the, the normal uh, maneuvers of hyperventilation and mannitol it's not going to help you Uh, you can retract the brain of the fox and just above the corpus callosum from the cingulate gyrus you can enter the ventricle straight release a bit of csf it will become lax and then you can proceed with your resection okay okay the next question is after the surgery you have done the surgery you have done a good job you removed the tumor the patient comes out conscious but not moving one side not um, moving one head what 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 do you think has happened uh, what is the move ma'am uh, it's a grade zero it it could be that uh, we've uh, injured the thalamus right vein or uh, we've injured the thalamus uh, itself what it is more have... likely if you are not injured a vessel can you injure the internal capsule directly perhaps um, injury uh, we, we could injure uh, along the uh, the lateral wall i'm not sure sir about this so when you put your retractor in the ventricle once you go below the corpus callosum there is an area just behind the caudate nucleus where the internal capsule comes right next to the ependyma okay and uh, if you put your retractor there or damage there you can get a complete hemiplegia so you have okay. to be extremely careful abida okay. you, you have any other explanation no sir that is the one that he's injured the genu of the internal capsule in the region of where he is injured it is in the region of foramen of monro so just lateral to it that is one explanation any other can you think of anything else he is conscious he is not verbalizing he is uh, not moving one side but he is quite conscious mm. uh, injuring the uh, the fornicial system ma'am oh. no can he be disconnected uh, sorry ma'am can he have a disconnection uh, ma'am since we have already uh, we were uh, we are uh, planning to go from the anterior uh, transcalosal approach the chances of having a disconnection syndrome would be uh, minimal but he i mean he can have uh, a disconnection syndrome if the uh, if we have extended the uh, callosotomy posteriorly anyway you can check whether it is hemiplegia due to injury or due to not moving due to disconnection it might not work all the time but there are some ways you can make out no ma'am nothing i can think of you so said the tone will be normal on that side and spontaneously there might be some intermittent movement when you don't ask him to do it if you just observe then maybe there is some movement it won't be very fast okay, okay. okay and the next scenario is patient comes out unconscious and not moving one side ma'am uh, thrombosis of the thalamus right vein uh, uh, progressing towards the internal cerebral vein <laughs> why you stuck with the thalamus right vein <laughs> more, uh, more, more, more more likely than that more likely than that okay i'll change the little bit patient has come out conscious is fine moving all four limbs within a little bit of time within maybe an hour and a half he starts deteriorating in sensorium then becomes unconscious not moving one side what other possibilities ma'am injuring not the uh, hippocampo mammillary tract more easier than that some more superficial yeah yeah <laughs> Um, uh, the RAS. <laughs> Where is the RAS there in the ventricle? You can you can start from the venous system itself. Yeah. Uh, you you can probably damage the uh, one of the important no one of the important uh, draining veins to the sagittal sinus. You can start from there, or you can get uh, thrombosis there. You might coagulate a very small vein because you think it can be sacrificed. but it can result into 
uh, further propagation so you you can get a proper venous infarct even in the cortical subcortical area forget about thalamus which is a very important but uh, uh, right from start you have to be very careful about that uh there are two other questions one is that why not do this of surgery endoscopically i think during my talk i will cover that and roman uh, one of the masters of neuroendoscopy is here so he will tell you uh, how he does it what i cannot do and uh, the uh, other question has been that uh, uh, what is one more question was there in the chat box uh which part of the ventricle is closest to the internal capsule abida has already said that i was trying to say that it is just behind the cordet but uh, she has been more specific it is right against the foron of munro on the lateral side and why not do a transcortical approach they are asking i will probably discuss you where to do transcortical and where to do transcalosal uh, during the course of my talk uh so do you think i should start talking now or uh, and i'll be very happy even during the talk if uh, abida or roman has any comments or you can stop me and uh, we can uh, sort out an issue and then go further is that okay yes yes john can i share my screen now yes uh... hello abby uh i actually have this talk which was originally prepared for abida's meeting uh <laughs> last year uh, but i have tried to add and subtract something so it won't be exactly the same okay uh, so Pro the first slide remains the same this is a central neurocytoma uh probably a little larger one than what rishab uh, showed it to us and which has been managed uh, quite well and person is doing very well and i am trying to say that intraventricular tumor is the same like our uh, old mumbai but the landmarks are changing and the ways of uh, traveling are changing so we are traveling by transcalosal way transcoroidal way endoscopic way but i think our destination remains the same and the once the new uh, what is it called coastal freeway comes i think we will be going faster and faster so basically i think we have to first salute walter dandy who published more than 30 articles way back in 1933 on intraventricular tumor surgery and we always think we are discovering something new a uh, special importance to this region was given by michael apuzo he came out with a book on surgery of third ventricle and roten made the understanding of various approaches and corridors especially much better by describing the microanatomy of the ventricle and surgical corridors and yasar gil has uh, written about a large experience on uh, uh, intraventricular tumors if you look at the pathology books you find that these are the various tumors that can occur within the ventricles primary intraventricular tumors choroid plexus papilloma carcinoma are the most obvious followed by ependymoma subependymoma and you can get variety of glioma starting with the most benign sega to uh, high grade gliomas central neurocytoma is a tumor which is very typical to the ventricular system and meningioma is another but fortunately much less common and uh, pnats can occur especially in young children and colloid cysts is another uh, and the congenital cysts are actually uh, in children and colloid cysts in adults are probably much more common than most other a uh, tumors described in india we also see cystic circus and rarely we may uh, encounter a metastasis also one of the beauties of intraventricular tumors diagnosis is that once you know the age of the patient and once you know the area which is involved you can most of the time tell what the tumor is most likely to be like if you have a lesion on one side uh, in the region of foramen munro usually you do not get it below the age of 5 years when you get it around the age of 6 years plus it is either a pilocytic astrocytoma or a choroid plexus papilloma or very rarely meningioma and uh, rarely metastasis if you have a lesion in the body in a, 
a younger age group it is universally a, a malignant tumor like pnat teratoma and the only benign lesion that can occur there actually is uh, choroid plexus papilloma and uh, uh, in the slightly older age group you find that ependymomas pilocytic astrocytomas very common and above the age of 30 most tumors occurring in the body of the ventricle are all malignant similarly in the trigone you will have more likelihood of benign tumors especially choroid plexus papilloma in children and meningioma in adults but occasionally you can get uh, various other lesions which could be more malignant so the ventricular anatomy has to be understood quite well this is a midline section some of these pictures uh, uh, are courtesy of uh, pablo gonzales my friend i should have probably asked uh, abida but i found them with me so uh, but she also has shown you beautiful dissections in the past and you do not obviously see the uh, lateral ventricles here because they are of the midline and you will see them when you do paramedian kind of cuts this is a cut which is to show the whole corpus callosum and the fornix uh, beautifully uh, and uh, this is another which also shows you the relation of these structures even to the temporal horn so basically whenever we are dealing with these patients they become symptomatic mainly because of hydrocephalus therefore the treatment aims at relief of hydrocephalus and then whenever possible cure from the tumor and it is challenging because of the difficulty in access because most areas except for a few which we just talked about are uh, eloquent areas and the other problem is that there may be pedicle uh, which is adherent to either the basal ganglia or uh, one of the important vascular structures uh, uh, microsurgical strategies depend on the anatomical considerations to reduce the risk of approach and of course uh, not to injure the vessels and endoscopic approaches have certainly made uh, it much easier for us to uh, understand more about the tumor and help us to remove it uh, uh, more accurately and sometimes uh, do that uh, without using microsurgery at all uh this is a endoscopic uh, view of the anatomy so once the uh, scope has been put in at the level of the choroid plexus it has first been gone back and you can see all along the choroid plexus right up to the occipital horn and then when you come to the coronal uh, uh, plane you will find that uh, you are at the foramen of munro and you can now see the uh, septal vein maybe internal septal vein quite clearly uh the thalamostriat vein is uh, over here and uh, you are seeing some vascular structure here and this is the choroid plexus so let us start with uh, pathologies in the anterior part of the ventricle and the transcortical approaches to it so this is a child with a pediatric uh, uh, patient about 5 years old boy who again presented mainly with raised intracranial pressure without any localizing signs and this was the tumor i actually thought that it is more likely to be an ependymoma there was absolutely no uh, uh, perifocal edema uh, and uh, when we opened i have this habit of putting in a reservoir first uh, uh, so that later on it becomes difficult to uh, sometimes if the ventricles collapse and here i had decided to go transcortical because as you must have seen on the scan it is almost touching the cortex on one side and therefore i did not want to go uh, transcallosal so i have made a small opening and we have reached there and you will find that uh, you immediately that is that is where the tumor is almost touching the ependymom on the surface and we are trying to separate it from there uh using kusa here and continue to debulk this it is separating nicely from the wall and you can see the attachment to the choroid plexus there is a quite wide attachment to the choroid plexus here and uh, further uh, tumor debulking now when you have such large veins it is always difficult to know are they the draining veins or are they important uh, veins draining the basal ganglia so once you come to the level uh, you know medial to the choroid plexus you would not like to take any vein as far as possible 
at the end you can start seeing the ependyma quite well and therefore uh, we have been able to uh, remove this tumor completely as you can see here central neurocytoma this is uh, another patient who has a large tumor uh, something like what we have seen today and uh, this patient again the decision between transcortical and trans uh, uh, callosal approach is taken mainly uh, on the basis of is it entirely contained within and is it touching the ventricular wall or not this is not only touching the ventricular wall it is probably uh, stretching it quite a bit so i decided to come again trans cortical here and a similar kind of opening made here and then the uh, these uh, tumors uh, have many many small uh, vessels and remain quite bloody though they are a benign tumor there is a lot of vascularity in these tumors and you have to be very patient while removing it and you can see that we have been able to gut the tumor and remove it completely at such a stage i have used this endoscope just to make sure that i have not left any tumor behind and then there is a good hemostasis since we have started using endoscopy our uh, percentage of keeping ventricular drains post operatively has reduced considerably and uh, post operative shunting has virtually uh, become uh, 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 it has it has not been a very common occurrence after that this is the post operative scan of this patient i usually get a ct scan done the very next day and uh, if i have put a drain i will usually remove it the next morning and uh, get an mri scan done 3 months later and you can see a complete excision and the patient is completely intact another reason to do trans uh, uh, ventricular uh, transcortical transventricular is this kind of a tumor this was also a neurocytoma but you can see it is occupying most of the body and the atrium and uh, the best way to remove this was i thought uh, to go transcortical on that side in ependymomas you get all kinds you can get a uh, ependymoma which is uh, infiltrative which is very large which is very vascular uh, like uh, this kind of a tumor which is very difficult to remove or this kind of a tumor or you may get a very localized tumor which you may be able to remove completely under the age of 3 years usually you try to remove the whole tumor by surgery and may have to use chemotherapy if you cannot but it is not very effective about the age of 3 years universal practice is that if you have left any tumor behind you will treat it with radiation so this is one patient this is a 3 year old child actually uh, who came with a ependymoma and you can see that this ependymoma is occupying almost both the frontal horns and though we managed to remove it completely we know that there is probably a little bit left at the bottom and this patient was then subjected to chemotherapy for about 6 dosages and then he was taken for radiation Uh, by the oncology team yeah. intraventricular meningiomas are rare almost 80% of them occur in the lateral ventricle very few in the posterior third ventricle and uh, very rarely in the lateral uh, in the fourth ventricle they can be seen at all ages and most likely they originate from the choroid plexus and uh, they can present either with seizures or hydrocephalus and the vascular supply is most important to know that lateral ventricular tumors are usually supplied by the lateral posterior choroidal artery the temporal horn tumors receive from the anterior choroidal artery and atrium tumors would be supplied by both the third ventricular tumors usually again from medial posterior choroidal artery and this helps because then you know that if you are taken the pedicle of the tumor it becomes much easier to uh, go and therefore rather than the usual parieto occipital uh, parietal approach posterior parietal approach as they call it i like to take a more <coughs> posterior approach to get to the pedicle early this is my strategy rather than going uh, this way i would like to go it uh, attack it this way and therefore this is the position of the patient this is the usual craniotomy and uh, i would usually orient uh, myself in the craniocaudal orientation and go from back to front because i can get a early control over the bleeding uh many a times we actually localize uh, our tract either with navigation or with ultrasound uh this is uh, with ultrasound for some reason we may not be using navigation that day and once you have reached the ventricle and you have found the tumor one of the important things i feel in intraventricular surgery is to pack off the surrounding area i mean except for very virtuous neurosurgeons who can operate without any bleeding 
uh, I, I find it very, very important to make sure that your bleeding does not spill into the whole ventricular system and you do not have an unfortunate part. So initially I managed to get rid of uh, uh, the posterior blood supply and thereafter the tumor could be gutted and removed very, very easily. And this is a post-operative scan. This is the tumor. I, as it was a smaller tumor, it was very easy to do this. And this is a post-op MRI after three months. Another patient, a similar kind of approach, not to damage the tracts very much. We try to dilate the tract with a inflated uh, uh, glove. And uh, this is the case. Small sulcal incision in the parieto occipital sulcus. And then again, trying to go behind the tumor, trying to go right to the base so that we can remove the, uh, we can coagulate the vascular supply first and then start debulking the tumor. And once you have seen the ventricular floor, it becomes much easier to hold the tumor and uh, uh, separate it from the ependyma. You have to be very careful. You do not damage any major veins uh, while doing this. And this is the post-operative scan. I have used similar strategy in choroid plexus papilloma as the ventricles are much larger in these uh, children. I like to use endoscope to begin with so that you can coagulate part of the, uh, uh, what is it called, the pedicle. And that makes it much easier to then remove the tumor. And you can either use a small <laughs> your tubular retractor, or you can actually do it without a retractor. I think uh, the four to six millimeter opening is usually good enough uh, with dynamic retraction with your uh, forceps and your suction. You can remove these tumors quite well. You have to be always aware that uh, you are not leaving tumor uh, bleed behind. Uh, and again, as I said, you have packed the whole area uh, to make sure that the ventricular uh, uh, is not filled up with blood by the time you uh, reach there. So most of the tumor has been gutted and uh, is being now separated from the uh, floor. And while you are doing that, you have to see it better. And I may use endoscope assistance uh, even here uh, to make sure that I have uh, removed it completely. You can actually shrink the tumor nicely Something similar that you will do in a very uh, vascular meningioma. Try to uh, shrink the tumor from outside by coagulation, from inside by gutting the tumor, and then remove it completely. And then make sure that you have uh, cut it off properly from its feeder and there is no bleeding inside the ventricle. There are now several commercially available retractors, but Dr. Yadav's simple plastic tube principle or using a syringe is quite easy. Uh, either for an endoscopic procedure or for a microscopic procedure. And this is a patient uh, uh, which we just saw uh, after surgery. If you have a tumor in the temporal horn, I think uh, the anatomy is well known. You have to be aware about the choroid plexus and where the blood supply is coming from. And this is looking at from the inferior view. And this is a meningioma where you can see that the uh, trigone was free and the blood su uh, supply I have lost the MRI of this patient and uh, unable to show you, but you could virtually see, uh, like you had seen in the other case, there is a tail going into the choroid plexus at the back here, you could see it going into the front. So I went through the uh, superior, uh, 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 the sulcus between the superior and the middle temporal gyrus and removed this tumor from there. And this is a choroid plexus papilloma in the temporal horn, removed again by almost the same kind of a mechanism. Uh, here, actually, you know, the ventricle had become so large that uh, it had uh, virtually become paper thin at one place where I have opened. And then uh, we are trying to gut the tumor after coagulating it bit by bit. And uh, eventually you will find that it is possible to devascularize first and then to remove the tumor completely. And uh, this is towards the end where the whole tumor has come out. This is a, a rare case. In fact, I have only one case of uh, a temporal horn cavernous angioma, uh, which was again excised by the same way. I have one in the third ventricle and one in the lateral ventricle. So very, very rarely you can get uh, uh, 
predominantly intraventricular, uh, uh, but they must be subependymal cavernomas. That's what I feel. Craniopharyngiomas rarely can be intraventricular, and there are both two ways to go about it. You can approach it either from the lamina terminalis, which is the corridor, which is very popular. We wrote about this in 90s and uh, did quite a few cases by this approach. You gradually, I first tried to get this tumor through the uh, optico-carotid triangle, but I could not. And therefore, I opened the lamina terminalis and I could manage to remove this tumor almost completely through the lamina terminalis, as you will uh, find here. And you can start seeing the Lilequist membrane. And the basilar top behind it. And this is how the uh, post-operative scan looks. A very, very satisfactory excision for this kind of a tumor. Another way where I found that their tumor wasn't actually reaching the whole of the floor of the... This is not a very common. I have only about seven cases of purely intraventricular tumors. This is one of them. And we have done this through the foron of Monroe. You can see that a small transcortical incision. You are visualizing foron of Monroe, which is dilated, rupturing the cyst, and then gradually decompressing it and eventually trying to get it uh, off the floor. And you can see an intact floor over there. Uh, so basically, transcortical approaches uh, are a good workhorse, but they not very popular today, mainly for the fear of seizures. In fact, there is a recent study which shows that the seizure frequency is as common in transcortical as well as transcalosal approaches. But our earlier training and our earlier uh, literature told us that it is much less likely if you went by the transcalosal way. And most of us shifted from transcortical to transcalosal ways uh, in 90s and stayed with that uh, till the endoscope came along. So seizures, hemiparesis, hemianopia, if you are doing a posterior uh, approach, and subdural effusions are common. So one of the other things to remember is that if you have been, if you have a massive hydrocephalus and if you have done a benign uh, large tumor, then you must make sure that you close the track properly. And I will talk about closing the track later on. And the other main reason of worry with uh, transcortical approaches is, of course, every transcortical approach has some approach related problems like the anterior one with hemiparesis, posterior transcalosal with not only hemiparesis but hemianopia. And uh, the middle temporal gyrus incision can be difficult on the left hand side, etc. So, interhemispheric transcalosal approach uh, was the most important approach when we started training and uh, uh, became very fond of and did quite a few cases. Uh, my first uh, almost 30. Colloid cysts were done only by transcalosal approach till I shifted to other approaches later on. And the access to the lateral ventricle traverses only a small area. That is what you have to see. The opening should not be more than 15 millimeters. It is hardly ever required to be bigger than that. And therefore, it carries a much lower risk of motor, sensory, visual, or cognitive disturbance. So this is a low-grade glioma. Absolutely ideal indication, a small, uh, smallish lesion causing obstructive hydrocephalus. Uh, there is hardly any septum here, makes it much easier. This turned out to be a pilocytic astrocytoma and could be completely excised with a cure. This is another patient operated somewhere else. They had taken a biopsy and advised the patient radiation and they came to ask me, should we do radiation or not? And uh, we got it, the specimen uh, re-examined, found it was a pilocytic astrocytoma. So I decided to go transcalosal. This is uh, actually an old uh, picture, old video with me from 90s, uh, which uh, this boy has uh, actually started his own garage after graduating recently. Uh, but uh, we could... Uh, I, this is the tumor. And the most important thing is you do not go after the tumor. You bring the tumor in your exposed area Try to gut the tumor in such a way that, uh, uh, you know, you bring the tumor in your visualization and then remove it. And in this manner, we have been able to uh, remove the tumor almost completely. Uh, this is the last component which is remaining on floor. But the beauty is that this we had seen very clearly on MRI that it was not stuck to the floor. And therefore, we were quite uh, uh, 
confident that we should be able to take this off the floor and that is where i think the coronal mri scan certainly helps me and you can see absolutely nice uh, uh, aqueduct and uh, floor of the third ventricle where we you do a lamina uh, sorry etv if necessary this is the post operative scan again the large uh, subdural collection you can see but this subsided on its own did not require any further surgery this is another uh, lesion which can be safely removed by not only transcalosal but these days for this kind of avascular lesions we are doing them predominantly by the endoscopic method i'll talk about it later but a low grade lesion in the septum near the foramen of munro is an ideal indication for transcalosal this is a larger lesion going into the third ventricle almost up to the floor uh, but we thought that as long as we have a dilated foramen of munro and we do not damage the fornix very much we should be able to go there again there is another important thing and this we will consider while doing choroid cyst that if you have a cyst going behind this then you need to open a little bit over here should you do it over the choroid plexus or under the choroid plexus but you should not be damaging the uh, uh, either the junction of the septum and uh, thalamus right vein or the internal cerebral vein while doing this so this patient could be completely excised by a transcalosal approach uh this is another patient with a subependymoma which could be done by i think this slide is repeated this patient actually i did not carefully see the scans uh i thought it was a colloid cyst but it turned out to be a pilocytic astrocytoma and we could do a good excision uh, though it was endoscopic excision more than like endoscope guided excision if you want to be uh, more clear about it and this is the post operative scan of that patient subependymal giant cell astrocytoma typically occurs in tuberculosis and nowadays rapamycin is available for a control but our patients can't afford it and the problem is if you stop taking it in between there is a uh, reactivation of the disease so therefore i think whenever there is a nodule near the foramen of munro you need to watch it and if it goes beyond 3 to 4 cm you must operate on it so this is a typical child uh, which i operated uh, some 10 or 12 years ago you can see the uh, typical uh, uh, cortical subcortical involvement and this is the tumor which was at the foramen of munro causing hydrocephalus this patient actually came with visual deterioration the tumor could be removed and thereafter the child regained vision to some extent another one it was a very large tumor and uh, this i am showing you mainly because though we managed to remove this tumor completely uh this presented with a large subdural effusion and it's the only patient where i had to do a subdural peritoneal shunt germinomas as uh, roman was just talking about can occasionally be purely intraventricular this is a supracellular germinoma and this is a predominantly intraventricular germinoma where i did actually a biopsy and a partial uh, the hormo uh, the tumor markers were negative uh, so therefore we did uh, a radical kind of excision and uh, this patient was then later subjected to chemotherapy this boy i operated i think in 2008 and he just about finished college he is doing quite well without uh, any residual tumor transcalosal approach was most popular for colloid cyst and this is one medical student uh, i operated somewhere uh, in 99 or 2000 where we got a new better microscope so pictures are a little better than the previous uh, uh, pictures and you can see that after uh, uh opening uh, this and taking the thick fluid out which is a cumbersome thing if you do are doing endoscopy uh, when you get such a thick fluid it becomes sometimes very difficult to remove the fluid uh, but once that is done and once the cyst has become smaller then it becomes much easier to remove this the tricky point is to remove it from its attachment with the choroid plexus very near the what used to be called the venous angle the junction of the thalamus right and the internal cerebral and the thalamus right vein at that junction sometimes it is adherent and therefore you have to be careful that is the part i am showing you now and therefore i have not gone rapidly for further and here if you are too adventurous you can damage the fornix as long as it is on one side you may not harm the patient very much but if you do it more in the midline or on both the sides then you can actually put the put the patient in trouble so you have to be very careful which colloid is to be operated and which is not to be operated has been controversial but i think this ccrs is a new <laughs> risk score 
which talks to you about the hyper intensity or hypo intensity diameter about 7 mm age below 65 and uh, if you have even little hydrocephalus associated i think you must go for surgery in colloid cyst so we already looked at transcortical and transcalosal way uh, i'll i'll just show you uh, another picture since uh, i have started using endoscopy i have started doing uh, transcortical approaches more commonly and whenever i have any problem uh, or uh, endoscope availability is an issue some days uh, then i would do it uh, uh, microscopically but uh, do it transcalosal and you can uh, use the same principles go a little more lateral and then first coagulate the attachment and then remove the lesion and it can be many a times if it is a small lesion can be removed almost completely without too much dissection like we could achieve in this patient you need not uh, i mean you may not be so lucky in every case but uh, so basically this kind of membranous uh, covering which is there uh, at the attachment so, uh, of the flexions, that has to be okay. very dissected and removed and make sure that you do not get into the venous structures at all uh, endoscopic approach usually you will go 4 centimeters lateral to the midline unlike ETV where you go about 2 to 2.5 centimeters and you go much further in front about 3 centimeters in front of the coronal suture so you get a proper angle to see we use this kind of a drainage uh, tube and after that you lift it up and then you coagulate with the other uh, forceps and that is how you separate it your separation from the venous angle is mainly with, with the uh, now people who use this and use instruments along the side can actually do a biomanual dissection but if you have to do it with only one hand you must be able to decompress the cyst and therefore <laughs> whenever the contents are thin i think it is easier to remove the cyst uh, and it is not so easy when the contents are thick another situation where endoscopic surgery can become a little difficult is posterior location of the cyst you can see here that the cyst is located much further behind than usual you can see it better on sagittal image and here i have gone transcalosal uh, and in fact transseptal to get this cyst out which made it much easier and uh, there was some element of uh, 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 memory issues in this patient for three or four months but eventually at the end of about three months uh, the patient could go back to work. So if you look at the meta-analysis, it seems that microsurgical resection of colloid cyst is associated with higher rate of complete resection, lower rate of recurrence, and fewer re-operations than with endoscopic removal, but the morbidity is probably higher in a microscopy compared to endoscopy. There are some other uh, uh, complications of transcalosal approach, you can get disconnection syndrome, you can get venous infarctions, you can get subdural effusions, and you can get hemiparesis and seizures like what uh, um, uh, Abhida was just describing. When you're talking about endoscopic approach, I think it is an excellent approach to get uh, uh, biopsy, to do extra procedures like ETV, septostomy, foraminoplasty, and it allows devascularization of the tumor by electrocoagulation and it may be possible to remove tumors completely. This is a typical example, and I think posterior third ventricular tumors are typically treated in this way today. You will do a third ventriculostomy in such a patient. And after you finish the third ventriculostomy, which is essential to take care of the hydrocephalus, then you go and then you take a biopsy of the tumor. And here I have repositioned the catheter because it was stuck into the uh, ependymal wall to end with. And this patient has remained stable since then. It's a very low grade glioma. We were considering to operate or not to operate, but the family wasn't very keen. And this patient is under observation for last three years without showing any progression. So I think it is very uh, standard now that if there is accompanying hydrocephalus in a posterior third ventricular lesion, you will do a ETV and a biopsy and depending on the pathology of the tumor, decide how to go further. And the safety has been studied in a multi-center study and been found to be uh, quite safe. The technical issues when you are doing this kind of biopsy depend on the size of the ventricles and thickness of massa intermedia. And I'll show you a classical example. This is a patient 
you have seen in the earlier patient we could safely just uh, tilt our tube and go into the uh, posterior uh, part of the third ventricle it may not always happen if the foramen of monroe is not very large or if the ventricular size is not large or if the massa intermedia is very thick so in this patient we have done a third ventriculostomy and then when we are trying to go posterior you can see that the massa intermedia is coming in between so we had to make a further anterior bore hole and then put the scope in from another uh, angle and then you see you are coming directly on this so if you want to take a biopsy on the posterior third ventricle as your main procedure then you should have a very anterior bore hole to do it so that your trajectory allows you to take a biopsy quite well and you may have to do a separate bore hole for etv uh, much further behind uh, another advantage of endoscopy is that this kind of a pineal region this turned out to be a germinoma you can actually see the sub ependyma studied with tumor cell so you can study uh, stage the tumor better and this is useful information for oncologist regarding their uh, chemotherapy regimes hypothalamic hematoma is another thing uh, which is a very peculiar indication this patient had the intractable epilepsy and we disconnected this from the mammillary bodies by an endoscopic approach uh posterior third ventricular this patient was an epidermoid as you can see on the diffusion weighted scan and uh, a shunt had already been put in this patient so make use of this corridor uh, roman gave a very beautiful talk on this approach uh, the other day so i i have used it in this particular case uh, we started off with microsurgery and uh, then when we thought that we had to depress the cerebellum quite a lot we do not go median we go paramedian in such cases and when it was becoming a little difficult i decided to use the endoscope brought the endoscope in and started removing rest of the uh, cyst and you will find that the strategically placed uh, epidermoid over the aqueduct could not have been removed just by a simple microsurgical approach unless you did a lot of depression on the cerebellum and uh, this could be very now aqueduct has become free after removing this particular piece and the epidermoid is almost virtually completely out so uh, even for endoscope assisted or endoscopic guided procedure uh, these kind of uh, uh, procedures are very useful uh, in intraventricular surgery this is the post operative scan resection of solid tumors is probably possible uh, this is one such patient we treated recently we have managed to get a endoscopic cusa and this is a tumor which is near the foramen of munro you can see it just uh, at the top of the foramen munro almost uh, becoming exophytic into the frontal horn and the body and we first took a biopsy this was a pilocytic astrocytoma and then we used endoscopic cusa and this works at a very low setting and in a avascular tumor it is very very easy to uh, take this out without causing any ependymal injury this is the post operative scan showing a complete excision uh, this is uh, the zuring device which we are using there is another device called nico myriad which is available in united states application of uh, neuroendoscopy i think has been very widely studied by the neuroendoscopy group and they have recommended it for tumor which are below 3 cm which are relatively avascular and where there is presence of hydrocephalus there is another lesson to be learned as usual this is a 2 months old child presented with choroid plexus papilloma and a massive hydrocephalus and this child we thought was too small we will not be able to excise it completely so temporizing we put in a shunt the problem was that with shunt the child got better but uh, the patient developed a huge amount of ascites the ascites was tapped every virtually every third day and eventually we decided to extrairize the shunt which was draining almost 300 cc per day eventually at the end of one week uh we decided that there is no other way to remove this tumor and this also shows you that hypersecretion can be a major issue apart from just uh, obstruction and this is one case where i have truly seen a hydrocephalus created by hypersecretion after i removed this tumor the patient has uh, been cured of hydrocephalus and does not require a shunt fortunately and the last thing i would like to say is that this is another neurocytoma patient this was a national award winning teacher from uh, amdavad and uh, i removed her tumor aggressively and i thought i have done a good job but she became virtually uh, in a comatose state for two weeks 
showed a little bit of uh, infarct in the front uh, as you can see and uh, uh, she was virtually in persistent vegetative state when she left the hospital at about uh, 12 weeks and it was a surprise to me at the end of one year she came back to my clinic uh, laughing and bringing some uh, uh, mithai as our patients usually do and telling me that she had joined the school back and she is uh, very happy to teach the students again and the scan looked pretty good so i think uh, one should not lose hope uh, where the lesion is uh, benign and you think you can aggressively remove it i think you should probably try and remove it and uh, uh, that is uh, the message i would like to give today thank you i would appreciate uh, abidas and dr roman's comments and questions of course uh, well chandra i must say that this is a, a ma amazing series of uh, quite large tumors intraventricular so i do not have opportunity to have such size neither such number so from uh, my experience there are in fact two main ports to the intraventricular tumors and one is from frontal either transcortical or interhemispheric and the other is from from back through the antrum so uh, in the strategy generally we look for a trajectory which goes uh, along the longitudinal axis of the tumor so in this kind uh, we can plan the entry point so the main problem as you said we should try to remove it it's that uh, in endoscopic we have a quite difficult orientation and a very tiny space and we must have quite good orientation and look to see the orientation points like to see the choroid plexus as soon as possible to see the big veins inside the ventricle or uh, long uh, this deep striatal vein um, to have some orientation and also the tumor must be favorable it should be as if possible soft and aspirable so for for the lesions in the third ventricle the entry point to for amen menro uh, is i think the main corridor and for amen menro can also be extended back by going into the <clears throat> transcoroidal fissure and cutting the septal vein so we can go much much posterior then so uh, but anyhow when we were doing this hollowing of this huge tumors i had one problem which everything goes fine is that generally i have the the this uh, cavity shrinks it slits and we have adhesions and we have a, a localized multi localized hydrocephalus so more or less Uh, i had to put a drainage to solve this problem thereafter this would be some what i would comment to your thank for your comments roman i agree that unfortunately like uh, the patient which was described by dr rishab today we get patients fairly late in the course of their disease and unfortunately uh, land up with very very large tumors uh, so the point is a challenge and it's it's a good challenge many a time sometimes you wonder <laughs> why why people come so late and how how can we uh, i think uh, that kind of education and more importantly i think people are still worried about brain surgery uh, abida your comments please there is one comment about use of endoscopy in small ventricles maybe roman you could uh, tell us about it are there any tricks to operate in small ventricles uh dr soviden seems to be the only one who is writing about it uh, frequently um so um the slit ventricles uh general i do uh, transcortical so this would be my prime and i'm doing it with the help of the endoport and uh here i'm using some cottonoid 
time to time I'm also uh, doing filling the cavity with water to expand and to put cotton to the posterior deep part to prevent uh, bleeding uh, going into the back parts of the tumor. Mm, but I think, in fact, we are, uh, when using transcortical, we are in fact always working in the air. So this is uh, microsurgery and with the help of the cottonoid, it uh, enables us to do more manipulations and also to expand the space, the space physically. So slit problem is, uh, slit ventricles are problem for full endoscopy, I think so. But for endoport transcortical, it's surgery on the air through the endoport with the endoscopic visualization. Abida, please. Uh, yeah, that was a yeah, very wonderful presentation showing all kinds of approaches to the lateral and the third ventricle and all quite a few variety of tumors that you have shown today, sir. I have most of these are the tumors that we see. Occasionally, we have seen epidermoids that are in the, especially in the region of the temporal horn. We have seen, I've seen a couple of epidermoids. And once I had operated on a choroid plexus tuberculoma. So in our country, that is another diagnosis that may come to mind when, you know, it does not fit the typical pattern of tumors that you see. And another problem with our country is the large tumors. So once you finish resecting the tumor, especially in a central neurocytoma, uh, the hemostasis is the most critical part. And we prefer to wait for quite some time to ensure that, you know, there is good hemostasis Otherwise, you're going to land up with a problem with a clot, which is, again, a challenging situation. So, otherwise, sir, it was a great presentation and you covered everything, I think. Thank you. Now, uh, questions from the boys. I think the only one question I could find in the chat box. Uh, did your most of your queries get answered or do you have any more questions, Rishabh? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I would like to ask is, uh, what are the structures which we would like to take care of while going by a transcalosal approach and one while going by a transcortical approach? Uh, since Abhida ma'am was describing three different conditions, a patient is awake and he is not moving his limb, a patient is awake and he is having a normal tone and not moving his limb and a patient is not able to wake up. She was trying to confuse you. <laughs> I think uh, basically what you have to remember is when you are going transcortical, we have all been taught that it is very, very safe to go through the middle frontal gyrus in front of the coronal suture to tap the ventricle. And uh, that point, it is called some point, right? What is it? Keen's point. Cocker's point. So frontal Cocker's, is Cocker's. Cocker's point. Sorry. Cocker's point. So... The question is, it is all imprinted in our minds and more so in uh, old minds like ours. Uh, but there are more and more, I mean, you never knew that uh, anatomy also will advance like this. Today, we know from the uh, position of the superior longitudinal fasciculus that it may not be the correct place to tap the ventricle from. And therefore, if you look at the DTI, the most safe corridor seems to be uh, to go between the sulcus of superior and middle temporal, uh, uh, sorry, middle frontal gyrus. If okay. you really, if you really want to save everything, and and therefore, then you cannot go just like what you were going, going towards the nose. You cannot do that. So you have to go towards the. So you have to be straighter. You have to be a little more in front, uh, or depending on where exactly you are in relation to the coronal suture. So I think today. If I have to do surgery, transcortical surgery, my preference has become to go trans uh, sulcal between the superior and middle temporal. Uh, yeah. Middle, middle frontal. Uh, yeah, I have written a small article on that in Neurology India a couple of years ago. Uh, the other thing is, if you are going transcalosal, I think she has already talked to you. One of the most important thing is sometimes the cingulate gyri may be fused. So you need to patiently separate them. Very rarely you may traverse the pia, but unless you see two pericalosal arteries, don't try to get inside the corpus callosum. You must locate both the pericalosal arteries. You must make sure that you are 
between the two pericardial arteries now there is one very rare anomaly i unfortunately uh, had to uh, had a chance to not unfortunately i would say fortunately because it made me aware uh, i was in montreal watching a corpus callosotomy surgery done by one of their senior doctors and he always used to get angiogram done for corpus callosotomy and i said why and he showed me the case he was doing had an azygous artery and it was really not possible to find the second uh, pericardial artery so he said otherwise i would be lost and if i damage this anterior cerebral artery the patient so basically this is a very rare abnormality so you should try to see both the anterior callosal uh, anterior pericardial arteries before you make an opening there is a recent paper which also talks about going transgenual so that you have a better access what has happened is with endoscopy we know that if you look from front to back it is easier to remove a colloid cyst without causing damage to the venous angle and therefore people have changed their trajectory a little bit even in microscopic surgery today uh what was the third question for endoscopic i think it is the same thing i do go through the middle frontal gyrus but i go much further forwards i go about 3 and 1/2 cm forwards for a choroid plexus uh, for a, a colloid cyst inside of course i think the most important thing is uh, not to damage the venous angle i think it is very very important if you leave a little bit of cyst wall behind i don't mind but you should not damage that because most of these patients uh, are you know otherwise very well and work working till the day they really come to surgery to you and they have to get back to their uh, so they are otherwise unaffected Uh, so one more question is: uh, Is there any are there any tips and tricks while while you are approaching uh, tips and tricks regarding the patient positioning? Uh, I think everybody finds their own way, but uh, I usually like to operate on them with uh, uh, the head is about thirty degrees uh, above the uh, heart, and uh, the patient's uh, head is neutral. uh that is what the position i prefer for anteriorly placed tumors for the parieto occipital approach i keep them in a uh, uh, lateral position and uh, uh, for endoscopic approaches they remain on a headrest uh, in the same position as it is for anterior transcalosal approach um does any of the other residents uh, would like to ask any questions to the pujari sir or abida ma'am or for that matter roman sir any other i think we have a couple of residents from nayar and sayan also joining in uh, tarunesh would you like to have any questions no sir it's okay it was a very session that the lot you 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 breaking up sir yeah you may have so, to go to the next question uh, no i i think uh, okay rishabh it was a good, good session yeah. learned a lot have okay sir why don't you text a question okay text a question please or comment so i think uh, if we sir i think if if we keep on having any other questions we can just type it in the chat box uh professor pujari would dev pujari would uh, like to answer a few of them uh, from my point of view i think sir uh, uh, it has been a very comprehensive uh, talk and uh, it has cleared a uh, quite a lot of our uh, views as to approach an intraventricular sol yes uh, in an exam point, from an exam point of view or for uh, that matter approaching a patient a patient is always going to approach with signs of raised intracranial hypertension it is going to be a very difficult and challenging task to uh, for the matter diagnose a patient with an intraventricular sol just based on a history if i'm not wrong correct correct yes so the major main important investigation of choice which we'd like to uh, do for this patient would always be an mri with a contrast study and asking for an coronal and sagittal images so as to look for the extent of the tumors superiorly inferiorly as well as antero posteriorly uh in what what type of cases would be specific, as you said like one of the professors uh, where you saw cases used to get an ct angio done or an mr angio done for callosotomy what are those specific cases 
wherein we like to uh, get an ask for a specific mr venogram or mr uh, angio for that patient any specific pathology in which we need to look for those uh, sequences i, I think the ventricles are not too big and uh, if you cannot see the foramen of munro very well you should do it even for colloid cyst i think or any lesion situated near that uh, unless you are a very experienced surgeon it may be a good uh, information to have before you approach it uh besides that i really do not think i mean uh, uh, as i said corpus callosotomy is a different operation than doing a transcallosal approach there you want to uh, you know go all the way right down to the fornices in the front and uh, uh, right down to the splenium at the back so you need to know the anatomy of the anterior cerebral artery much better to make a small opening into the corpus callosum it is not really necessary so i think uh, we are we are okay with uh, uh a good mri okay uh any other further comments from abida ma'am on roman sir or any other questions from the participants if we don't have any comments or uh, questions i think we can wrap up okay very good i uh, thank all of you great interactive session and and uh, uh, we have and, one question okay go ahead yeah so the question in the chat box is do you use double endoscope approaches at the same time same operative time if yes what cases any examples by dr petru i think i will allow roman to answer that the only time i have used biportal approach is sometimes when the uh, i show you one case uh, where the massa intermedia is very big and you uh, do atv by one bar hole and then i uh, uh, take that out and then go through the second but simultaneous use of both is not been done roman you have any experience um, no i i have neither used this simultaneous by portal never your uh, neighbor uh, you know in the siberia what's his name in tuman uh, sufiano uh, sufiano he yeah. he describing by portal approach for choroid plexus papillomas and some other tumors i have seen one of his videos where he has used to <laughs> one from front and one from the back okay yes uh, one last question sir uh, uh do you prefer uh, going endoscopic for third or fourth ventricular tumors or it's largely limited limited to the lateral ventricular tumors no in fact uh, it is uh, i am more comfortable in the third ventricle with the endoscope than uh, in lateral ventricles because uh, it it is not very easy unless the ventricle is really very large it is not very easy to reach back into the atrium and uh, uh, occipital horn if you have a lesion near foramen of munro okay. and in the third ventricle i think endoscope is the best and uh, as i showed you that you can probably do a good biopsy of a posterior third ventricle and if something is lying in the quadrigeminal cistern you can go from the back in the supracerebellar approach and do you always prefer being uh, outside of the tumor and uh, the way you showed you covered the entire of the tumor with cotinoids and uh, you went on dissecting and uh, uh, using a cusa while taking out the tumor so do you uh, always prefer doing that uh, for lateral ventricular tumor doing that in uh, almost all tumors uh, but more important in uh, intraventricular tumor because you don't want blood spillage inside okay okay i think uh, majority of the queries especially for me i have been uh, it has it has been answered if there are any further last questions or last comments from anyone uh, any comments from abida ma'am abidamam slept no i'm here so much no i think we had a good session okay so i think we'll wrap it up i'll thank uh, dev pujari sir abida ma'am and uh, professor roman to join the session and making it so interactive thanks a lot we'll be coming back with our another episode of interactivity for the residents and by the residents and uh, as always i'll thank john
for being the main pillar and providing whatever is necessary thanks a lot everyone yeah you know this is this is why i do this i mean it, this interactivity is fantastic and chandra always gives a great lecture and he's a great man he's a he's a great teacher uh you know i'm not a neurosurgeon but i just watch the time he spends uh and it was certainly nice for roman to come by and of course abby i was surprised to see you glad to see you uh, and we look forward to the next episode so thanks everybody thanks yes. john thanks rishi thank roman. you sir thank you very much <laughs>